Lovely, thank you. That's fine, thank you very much. Okay, well, what I, uh, what I want to do is in three parts and um, bearing in mind the time, I, I try to get it to be uh, 20 minutes at the most in each of the three parts, but probably less. Uh, and uh, the first part is to give you um, a, a rationale as to why we went to Turkey, um, what we were doing there, um, and uh, how we can um, understand something about our authority um, in these days. God has invested so much in us, and, and that, that is quite awesome. Uh, and it's all of grace, but he has given us great authority. It's delegated, but it's his authority that he shares with us. And I, I want to share a little bit about how the bride can operate with such authority. And then I'm going to show you some uh, film slides uh, of uh, on a PowerPoint presentation um, for about 15 minutes and just talk you through some of the things that we saw and that we did there. And then thirdly, um, I'm going to uh, share with you what is the message that I gave at the very last place that we visited, which was at the site of the church or the city uh, of Laodicea. And, and the reason for that is because not only were the set seven letters of Revelation chapter two and three written to real churches and communities of believers, and they had a very important word to give to them, but they are often looked at by many people as being prophetic letters in the sense they weren't just for those seven churches, but they were a description of seven periods of church history. Now, I'm not a rigid dispensationalist. I try to keep open, uh, but I can see the sense and value at looking at each one of those letters, which we're not going to do today. I'm just going to look at the one um, I was asked to speak on, uh, which was Laodicea, which represents the last period. It's the seventh church and consequently the seventh period of church history, which correlates to this time in which we live. So it's very important that we understand what the spirit is saying in that letter to the church, not only to the point of view of what was it saying to the church and the believers at Laodicea, but what was it saying? What is it saying? What is he saying to us today in this seventh season of the church? Seven meaning complete, of course, and so it's quite significant. Now, I, I want to do that, if I may, by, uh, and this is not a deliberate, um, uh, a de deliberate advert, but this is a, a book that I've just written and had published, and it's called A Journey of Ascent Towards the Bridegroom. But I want to read from it, if I may, for this first little part, because when I was writing it, I felt very much the Holy Spirit uh, with me at work, and not only in the thoughts, but in the um, in, in, in the content uh, and the revelations. So the way it was put down was as much, I believe, I'd like to believe, anointed as the ideas themselves. So I'm going to read a little bit from it. Um, if anybody wants a copy, yes, it's on Amazon. Um, and it's called, uh, once again, A Journey of Ascent Towards the Bridegroom. A Journey of Ascent towards the bridegroom. Now, as you know, the, the Lord has been gracious and uh, in, in sharing with, with me um, the, the bridal paradigm um, to, to the extent that I, I, I can't see anything else. <laughs> No, not quite, but you know what I mean. When you have a buy a new car, a red car, you, everybody else has got a red car because you've become sensitized to red cars. So I've been sensitized to the 
the, the, the bridal paradigm. And um, it, 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 I see it everywhere in scripture now. Um, and uh, so, uh, but one of the things that really does concern me is the fact that people uh, give lip service to the bridal paradigm, to the idea of being the bride, and will say, um, yes, I, I, I know uh, that we are, or there is, the bride of Christ, but it's like a theology. And it's almost as if they've said, um, well, I've done that one, and they put it back on the shelf. <laughs> And I've done justification and I've done uh, redemption and, uh, and, and, and I've done the bride of Christ. But the bride of Christ is a paradigm. The bride of Christ is, 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 is a, a way of, of being. And not only does the message um, have to be understood so we understand the message, but the message has to get us. It has to transform us because it is our end time identity. So let me uh, to switch this light on here so I can, that's better, so I can see what I'm reading a little bit more clearly. And let me read a little bit to you, if I may. As they always say, are you sitting comfortably? And then I'll begin. The corporate and glorious bride is not only authorized to intercede in the heavenly courts and possess the gates of her enemies, like Re Rebecca was given, because of her, but because of her dependency on her bridegroom, she also, and her relationship with him, she also has a eternal nature. She is able to operate from within time and space and outside of it. She is also able to bridge both. This is because the bride, the Lord said to me one day, occupies an eternal space from where she op operates. It's, it's like, uh, I'd like to explain this revelation further, but first, I, I want to explain the major differences between the body of Christ and the bride of Christ as I see it. The body of Christ exists on earth. And that's who we are. And it's an analogy of showing how we are meant to be one and function as one each part of the body having its own gift and own uh, ability and work together in cohesion. But the bride of Christ is that which we are becoming and already are by betrothal. Now, that's because, as you know, in a Jewish uh, ceremony of marriage, um, the betrothal is as binding, and it used to be in our country regarding engagement, as is the marriage. And that's why Joseph, of course, was very worried and uh, sought to put Mary as, uh, into a hiding place to protect her, because they were engaged, but yet not the marriage was consummated. But it was as binding. So even though we are not yet fully the bride, because our con wedding has not been consummated, the, the, the wedding of the lamb has not taken place, there is a measure in which we can enjoy and experience some of the benefits, some of the privileges of being the bride. So if I then just move forward a little bit, and pick up exercising authority as the bride, as a corporate being. The bride is not singular. She's not made up of many brides. She is one bride. She is a corporate being. And that corporateness gives her a measure of authority which is 
beyond that which we experience as individuals. The Bride of Christ is created to enjoy much intimacy with her bridegroom. <laughs> Just turning this page, if I may, of course. Now, the, what is the difference between authority and power? There is a huge difference. The devil has power. He certainly has power, which he gains through blood sacrifice and by uh, his activity in, in, in a horrible, heinous way. When blood is shed, demons and Satan himself gains further power. But the, but the authority is always delegated. And I want to explain to you the difference between the two by giving you a little uh, story that I heard. And uh, it's about a police lady who was quite slight, quite small, quite short. Uh, and she was sitting one day in uh, her car at the entrance to a very busy one-way road. As she got out to look along that road, she saw to her horror a huge truck coming fast along the one-way system the wrong way. And she knew that when the traffic at the other end came round the corner, the blind turn and headed up towards it, there could be a disastrous accident. So she gets out of her car and this little short police officer in her white shirt begins to walk towards this approaching lorry. As it gets close, she can hear its engine throbbing. It had great power underneath that bonnet. It could completely smash her, crush her, destroy her. But she must do her duty. So she walks towards that coming lorry. And at a given point, she puts up her hand and she says, stop in the name of the law. And the lorry comes to a stop. Now, that lorry had power, but she had authority. She was acting in authority, delegated authority. It was who she represented that gave her such authority. Now, many of you will have heard that story or that illustration, but I hope it's helpful for those who haven't, that the devil does have power, but we have authority because God, in his grace and wisdom, has delegated it to us. I was, I was speaking in Cuba, and one day the Lord said to me, I want you to talk about authority and I want you to show that there are three levels of authority and I said Lord tell me tell me more what you mean and he began to share that there was singular authority now if that's the authority where if we pray in his name as an individual person with faith believing in his name then God will answer but Jesus said if we ask anything in his name he will answer but then there's the plural authority singular plural that's where two or three are agreed on anything touching anything and it's called, isn't it, the prayer of agreement. And this prayer of agreement is so powerful. That is plural authority. And then there is corporate authority. And that corporate authority is that which comes from and by the bride because she is a corporate being. She can never be singular. She can never be 
plural, she is corporate. Whether together or separated, the bride is a corporate being. And that releases an authority which is absolutely so necessary today to represent the king, to represent the Lord Jesus. And so as I was sharing these things at a conference in Kenya some years ago, the intercessors for Kenya at whose conference they'd asked me to, to speak, uh, grabbed hold of this and began to see that as intercessors, they had a power and an authority delegated by the Father. But because they were beginning to understand their bridal identity, like Esther representing the king, if it please your majesty, was able to decree, they had the power and the authority to decree and proclaim in his name. So this led to us going to uh, Turkey. And the reason is that uh, I had had a Facebook uh, contact with somebody, which I responded to, which simply said, on Facebook, come over to Macedonia and help us. And I began to think, wow, I've got to respond to that. Who is this? I don't know who this is, but I'll write back and I'll correspond with this person. And I did and found that they were from Macedonia, which was, of course, one of the places that uh, Paul visited, and uh, he too had a dream, didn't he, of seeing this man who was saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And so started an idea in my mind that the Holy Spirit was asking me to go to some of the places of the first century churches. And with the authority that we had got to, to open the wells the, of salvation and revival, there by decree, which had got blocked up, which it needed unblocking, that the rivers of life could flow again, once again. At the same time, the intercessors for Kenya, who we had been in partnership with, also heard a word from the Lord, exactly the same, not about Mesopotamia, but about going to the churches in Turkey. And we realized that the Lord was really speaking to us all that we should go on a prophetic assignment, trusting him to lead us to decree and to declare and to begin to open up the wells of salvation and revival there. Uh, so we set off and we set off to go to Turkey uh, on the 27th, uh, in my case, of this month, uh, last month of September, and we came back on the 1st and 2nd of October. Now, let me show you some of the pictures that uh, I have. If I'm sharing screen, you will see some things here, which I'm afraid you will excuse as I look for the PowerPoint. And we will start here. Howard, I can share it if you want to. Oh, yes, please. Yeah. Would you do that? OK. OK, let me, let me take that off. That would be great. And I can go back to Zoom. And they can see me. Wonderful. So. Right. What group? So we'll, we'll, we'll start. Objective. Yes. Let me show you the objectives. So we'll start with the objectives. Here we are. The, the objective was to reopen the ancient wells of revival in the early church, first dug by St. Paul on his missionary journeys, and to cause the waters of life to flow once again in these places, to reopen the ancient wells of the truths long preserved in the scriptures, but ignored or corrupted today 
in our quest for conformity to modernism, to dig wells and to birth new wineskin churches capable of carrying the end time new wine truths both in Turkey and around the nations. To blow the trumpet, the chauffeur, to announce an acceleration in this new season for the global church, which is marked by an emphasis on our bridal identity, symbolized by seven, seven being perfect, complete. So we're in the seventh season. Five, to fan the fires of this global bridal movement so that it becomes unstoppable like a raging forest fire. To sound a trumpet, to announce the imminent coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the day of atonement and judgment. Seven, to cause his people everywhere to prepare themselves for his coming and to cry, come. Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Now the next one. And the next. Now there is a map of Turkey. So you just know whereabouts it is. You'll notice Turkey is up there in the top left-hand corner in an olive green color, which is very, uh, uh, very symbolic because they grow so many... Uh, olive trees in Turkey, and it, it's so, so beautiful to go past the vineyards uh, of olives. So on the north, you have the Black Sea, and on the south, you have the Mediterranean Sea and the Aegean Sea as it comes close towards the land. So that's where we went, and we actually went to the area at the far left-hand edge. So if you look at the T of Turkey and beyond that out towards the close to the left, that's where you'll find the seven churches, the seven sites. The next one. Now, as I said, people, some people put these seven letters in a prophetic position and they uh, uh, divide them up into representing these periods of time. Now, they're not all, there are many, many different versions of this. And although we went with the apostolic church in uh, number one, and then the persecuted church and the Roman Empire church with Constantine uh, making Christianity the religion of the empire, and then the 600 to 1517, the domination by the Roman Catholic Church. And that's when so much corruption, unfortunately, came in and heresies and control. And then, of course, the, the light came and reformation in 1517. And, and, and then the missionary church outreach. And, and it says the apostate church, but we interpret that slightly different in the light of understanding the glory of this season. Uh, when God has given us a chance to understand the secrets of his heart, the revelations that he has reserved to this end time church to prepare her for the wedding of the Lamb. Next. So here you see where those seven churches are. The name in black uh, is the uh, uh, name as it comes in Revelation 2 and 3, uh, and the modern name, Pergama, uh, etc., for Pergamon, and uh, Smyrna for Izmir, Izmir or Izmir, uh, below it there. So that's where we went, and we managed in those five days to travel all that distance. Turkey is 2,000 kilometers long and 1,000 kilometers from top to bottom. So you can imagine this is quite a lot of traveling that we did in coaches. But I have to tell you, I've never been with such a group of intercessors. It was a privilege. They didn't just look, go on a sightseeing tour on the coat from one place to another. They were praying 
all the time. And it, prayer had been organized all the time. And his, this is the, uh, the brochure that uh, the leader of the intercessors for Kenya gave me, which uh, details who will take the lead on one of the journeys in prayer, leading the others in prayer. Very well organized, but very thorough in their praying. They were always praying. I felt a little sorry at times for the coach driver who couldn't speak English very much, but uh, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of noise or, or expression of praise and worship in the coach. Now, this is about our first meeting. If we go to the next one, we'll see we are in the hotel. These pictures are a little bit stretched out, so don't worry if we look a bit odd. So here I am sitting there, and you'll see there's a crown and a scepter. Before I went, the Lord told me I was to take a crown and a scepter. And I was to always remember that the, the king, if it please your majesty, must lower the scepter, that we don't presume anything. And we always ask for permission granted, knowing that he is the king of kings and the lord of lords. Next, I'm uh, in, a, in a just telling the Lord exactly what I've told you and, and acknowledging that before him and lifting the crown, as in the next picture, as you'll see, I'm lifting the next up to heaven and to the Lord. Standing next to me there is uh, Apostle Phoebe, a wonderful woman of God, who is the leader of the intercessors. Next. I felt led of the spirit that we needed to pray for her. So I asked the others if we could just gather and pray for her, for she had worked so hard to put this together. I joined them, and uh, it was a privilege, and they did all the hard work and organization. Next. Why, but why I've shown you this was uh, we started, I, in prayer, I got there from the airport and within quarter of an hour, 15 minutes, we were in the prayer meeting. We were upstairs. And look where they gave us. They gave us the topmost room with a panoramic window looking out all over uh, Izmir, looking out over that land. And we were able to pray from that tower over Turkey, over that city representing Turkey. Next. Now, the Africans are extremely colorful. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that wonderful? And, and I, I show this because not only are they colorful and, and they caused quite a stir uh, wherever they went and people wanted to take pictures and so on, but that gave an opportunity for testimony and for preaching and, and for uh, in, encouraging them to understand faith. We need to pray for Turkey. It's an incredibly secular country. It is a Muslim country, but in the same way in which we, uh, 10 years ago, up to 10 years ago, might have put down on a form, what religion are you? And we'd put Christian, but it didn't mean anything. So in the same way, most of the people in Turkey are Muslim, but very few are practicing Muslims. Um, and... Uh, there is an incredible dearth of understanding about Christian things. What they know about Christian things are the antiquity, are the churches that, uh, uh, or, or um, uh, ruins of cities, and they know something about uh, these are the seven cities of uh, Revelation, simply because it's a tourist attraction. Um, but they don't know. And so one day they asked us, well, what ch church are you from? This was Joseph, who was the guide for us. We went on an official tour of these seven places. And at each one of those places, we asked him if he would allow us to have an hour where we could preach and record what, what the, uh, the, the, the talk based on each of the seven churches as we went round those seven churches. And that has been put together as a conference which is going out live from Nairobi even now as the first day. Uh, but when we said, well, in answer to his question, well, what church are you from? Um, we said Pentecostal. We had great difficulty 
in being able to explain because they hadn't even heard, he hadn't even heard of Pentecost. They have very little knowledge of scripture, very little knowledge of Christian festivals, except Christmas, of course, which they enjoy, but perhaps don't even understand fully its meaning. So I was so thrilled to go to Turkey for be, with these lovely, lovely African people. And the Lord said to me so clearly before I set off, Howard, I want you to go to facilitate for them the fulfillment of Isaiah 19. Now, you know, Isaiah 19 talks about Egypt and Assyria being a third each in, 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 in the creating of the highway of holiness and in the end time, a prophetic fulfillment. Uh, and that Egypt, of course, rep was representative of Africa because Egypt was so huge in the days in which that was written. And it referred very much to uh, people uh, of African descent. And so um, it is Africa's uh, mandate in these end times to go to the nations um, and to take not just the gospel, but the end time truths of the return of Jesus. And he was saying to me, I want you to go to facilitate in part in, 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 a, in your way um, this time for these people, the fulfillment of Isaiah 19. And that was such a privilege. Uh, next. Here's another. Yes. Wonderful. There's Phoebe again with this beautifully colored uh, dress that she's wearing. Next. Now, the first thing we did was to blow the chauffeur at the clock tower in Izmir, where the hotel was. Next, and you'll see in this next picture, this um, amazing tower, beautiful building. Uh, we can't quite see the clock at the top, but it is there, I assure you. And there's a, the group of us standing there about to blow the chauffeur. And the reason for that was that as some of you know, uh, about 10 years ago now, or maybe less than that, um, there, uh, yeah, just let me close the door here a minute. Somebody, somebody must have come to the door and the dog is barking, that's right. Some time ago, the, the Lord led me to be in London and to uh, go to a meeting uh, and we were speaking about the bride and we thought this was the beginning of a, a bridal movement in the UK, but unfortunately time had run out um, at the meeting and we weren't able to give that address. And so we were a little confused as to wondering why we had come all the way from Cornwall, 300 odd miles to London uh, for no reason. And I had got my chauffeur because I was going to blow the chauffeur um, at that occasion. And we came across Westminster Bridge and there was Big Ben. And some of you may have heard the, me tell you this before, but we knew why we had come to London. It was to blow the chauffeur under the, the, the Big Ben clock, which sets GMT, sets the time around the world to declare that this was the season of the bride and to announce a bridal awakening with the blowing of the chauffeur and to bring an alignment between the time and season of the UK with the time and season of heaven. And like dominoes uh, all put in line, you knock one and the rest go and they all fall down so this would have a knock-on effect by blowing it there under Big Ben and decreeing and proclaiming that, that uh, this is the season of the bride and decreeing an alignment between the time and season of, of the UK and that of heaven. And so when, wherever we go, the Lord seems to uh, instruct us to do the same. And so we, we stood together and we prayed, interceded, praised, blew the shofar, and decreed an alignment 
between the time and season of Turkey with the time and season of heaven. Next. So there it is again in the sun, a little bit clearer to see. Next. Now an agora is a marketplace and in Smyrna, uh, which is Izmir, the, new, the, new, the old name of uh, that city, there is a excavated uh, basement uh, of um, which was used as a marketplace in the time of Sir Paul. And Paul would most likely have gone there and um, may have walked on the very path where we were walking. And in the next picture, you'll see. Um, I don't know whether you will be able to hear this video because when I tried it before, I could hear it, but I'm not sure whether others could, but we'll give it a try. It, it, we are standing, believe it or not, by the first place that the guide unknowingly, knowing, not knowing about our remit and our mandate, took us to, and it was a well and a spring of water. How about that? We had come to unblock the springs of water, to unblock the wells, and the very first place he took us to was this water flowing out. So let's have a try and see if we can, um, if, um, so with that, we will now release the sound of the chopper and the leaves of a nation to awaken the bride. The time is near for her to get ready for the bride. Thank you, Father. Your time is near to return. Thank you, Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, come. <laughs> You can see the water flowing and people would come and cup their hand and drink. It wouldn't be interesting to, uh, to imagine St. Paul coming past and, and, and cupping his hand and having a drink of water. Amen. Amen. Let's see if we can. Now we got to, got to go to the next one. If, we can. if it will. The the time is near. Ah, right. No, I'm just going to just re I'm just going to adjust it a little bit. Yes. Okay. Okay. Did Did you manage to hear the the sound of that? Yes, thank you. Oh, good, 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 good. I'm glad you heard. So, yes, it was a, a real, real privilege. So I'm going to move very fast because time goes by so quickly um, in through the rest of the pictures because I want to be able to just say, perhaps have 10 minutes to share the message here we come right so there's the agora there it is there's the basement of the building that has been excavated and it's flowing there thank you so and there it is and the next one let's just move through fairly quickly because we've seen these and now then we went on to Sardis, Philadelphia, Bergamon, and Thyatira. Let's have a look at some of those pictures. 
in here. <laughs> a man in the middle there is one of the leaders with Bibi of uh, Intercessors for Kenya, a lovely man of God. Next. So everywhere they had re-erected what they had found under the ground, um, covered by earth for many centuries. And next, there, there were so, so many um, types of, 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 of uh, pillars. Some were the Corinthian from uh, the Greek period, some were the Roman. Next. It was just amazing to be there. And then on, we went to Heriopolis which is near Laodicea. Now, just a, a quick uh, mention of this. This is actually a salt deposit because the Romans had discovered that uh, there was uh, salt deposits flowing in from water that seeped through rocks in the mountainside. And they then turned this into a spa resort for the aristocracy of the day. And today you can go and see the buildup of the uh, salt deposits uh, and uh, the irrigation system, because it must have water flowing over it. Uh, otherwise it dries and, 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 and disappears. Um, so next, please. And the next, there's another picture of the same. And, and it's very salty. This uh, African dear lady, Mary Jo, is bending down and sipping it, tasting it. You see how thick are the deposits of salt. And this was at Heriopolis. And that's quite significant for uh, Laodicea and the message given to Laodicea. Next. Uh, and this is at a church dedicated to Apostle John in Ephesus. You see this one? Because remember, uh, we won't worry about this. Um, I, I don't think oh, you might be able to hear it. We, We're outside we the church. Father, to alert heaven to what we have cried and to seal, to seal in, if we may, your majesty. Mm. If we may, your majesty, if it pleases the king, mm. and you are the king of kings, would you seal what we have prayed and what's been in our hearts to see established Hallelujah. and what we yeah. have put Amen. Amen. Okay. That's fine. Let, let's let's move on. Just give you an example of what we were, were doing there. We had some keys. The Lord told us to take some keys and we opened the doors in the spirit and closed them and so on. Now, this is at Ephesus. That previous picture was a picture of the library in Ephesus. This is a side road coming off the main road that Paul had walked on, that we're actually on at the moment, coming from right to left. Next. And we pass. Um, okay. It was an absolutely incredible picture to see. I, I, I'm going to try and see if I can. Um, no, I won't. I won't bother because time is running. So now we come to Laodicea. Let's look at Laodicea the last, the seventh, there was a church here, which was completely uh, re redeveloped but without a roof, but the walls were up and the mosaics were unearthed. And it was a church that went right the way back to the time uh, of after St. Paul, but certainly in the second century uh, AD. Next. There you are. Next, you're just simply saying it is the Church of Laodicea. And that's the same again. Move on. And we, we went around and they beautifully laid this out so you could actually look uh, walking on glass so you could see that which was underneath. Next. And this, here's the road. Uh, it, it, it's, it's quite awesome to think, you know, you're walking down a road that Paul would have walked on. And the early apostles and the early in the missionary journey. Next. Right. Now, 
Okay, let's close the uh, uh, that and just go to the message that I wanted to, to concentrate on in the time we have left. Um, Brenda, can I ask you how long we have? Because I need to then judge the time. Um, well, we normally finish between half past and 22. Okay. Uh, so okay. if it, 10 minutes is fine. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Um, the, the message that Jesus had for the Church of Laodicea uh, is as relevant for us today as it was 2,000 years ago uh, when it was first delivered to this particular community of believers. However, because many suggest, as we've said, that it, it's a prophetic letter too, it's very relevant to us because it's the last season. It's the last period of time that it represents. First, let's look at the what Jesus was saying to the Laodicean church. He, he introduces himself as the great a, a, a men. And now we use the word amen when we, when we pray and we say it means so be it. But the great amen is he whose very word and very nature is the final and fixed word on everything. And that's how he introduced himself. I am the great A.M. Amen. What he says is established, will be done, has in itself the power to accomplish what he said. So it is settled. Then he says, I am the faithful and true, or he who can be trusted, for there is no unrighteousness or falseness or untruth in me. There is no shadow of turning, no complacency and compromise. He is the ruler of the universe. That's how he introduces himself. This is the supreme sovereign being one with the father. He is the king of the universe, the ruler of his father's entire creation. And from this opening, he goes on to say, for I who is true, who am true, I, who am trustworthy in all my ways, I know your works because I see and, and know all. He is omnipotent, all-knowing, omnipotent, all-powerful, omnipresent, all-present. It's not the first time we've seen him as the omnipotent. Uh, all-knowing one, all-seeing one. He first introduced himself in that way to Hagar, didn't he? When she then said, uh, he is the uh, all-seeing one, the uh, Jehovah Ruah. This all-seeing one is also so faithful and true and assesses all matters so wisely and judges uh, us fairly and righteously. However severe is the judgment, it is just and fair. And in this letter, he certainly judged the Laodiceans very severely indeed, to the point that he compared them and their works to vomit and said that he would vomit them out of his mouth. But our translation of the word to spit them out of his mouth um, is, is not strong enough. But the strength of the Greek word here is to vomit out. That's how disgusting and horrific their condition was to him. It made him sick. And why was this? It was because of compromise. It was because they had compromised their faith because they had allowed culture and custom to be more important and wealth to be more important than their faith. He said to them, you are lukewarm. You are neither hot nor cold. I would that you were hot or cold, but you are lukewarm. Now it's very interesting to the Laodiceans, this would have been fully understood because those salt deposits 
were created by hot water at Hierapolis. And Hierapolis was a city not far away from Laodicea. Laodicea had a water problem. It had tepid water, lukewarm water, and it was disgusting. And you really just wanted to spit it out. So they neither had the cold water of Colossae, which was another city not far away either, uh, within walking distance, uh, or the hot waters of Hierapolis. They had lukewarm water. Even the water that was brought uh, to them, cold when it began from Colossae, by the time it got to Laodicea was lukewarm. So they would fully understand what Jesus meant when he said, you are lukewarm. You are neither hot nor cold. But Jesus also says to them, buy from me salve for your eyes that you may see. I believe that's a message for the church today. You see, they would also understand fully and immediately what Jesus made, meant because the Laodiceans were famous for making a, a potion or, or a balm that, that was good for the eyes. It was, it was famous for this eye salve and they would sell it to people coming and going and they had an industry based on it. And so when Jesus said, buy from me, salve that you may see. Then he goes on to say to them, come to me and buy clothes, uh, uh, beautiful white garments. Come to me and, and buy gold. You, are, you are, think you are wealthy, but you are naked. You are poor, you are wretched, and you are blind. Laodicea was famous for growing Black or, or, or creating uh, from um, sheep that were that had black wool uh, garments that were beautiful, beautiful dark black garments. They made cloaks uh, embroidered with gold just for the aristocracy and the rich, and and they were famous for that. And Jesus said, "Come, come, let me give you the robes. Let me give you white garments." Let me come to me and buy from me gold. I wish that you would see. And if we were to take this particular message for today as the seventh message that the, the, the Lord is saying to the church, I think we would say that what this period of time, what is necessary in this period of time is that we understand and we see the time and season that we are in. Now, you, you understand I have a, a whole message that I could deliver, but there isn't enough time. So I'm just wanting to emphasize that the letter to the Laodiceans, the final message was to appeal to them that they would come and buy from him that which would enable them to see and understand the time and season that they were in. That's the message to us, that we understand the time and season. When I was thinking about this, about buying from me, I thought, Lord, I don't understand because we don't buy from you. What, what do you mean? And he turned me, of course, to Isaiah 51, which talks about come uh, and buy. Uh, from me without money. And he began to share with me once again the fact that the currency of heaven is faith. There is a money currency, if you like, but it's faith. And the currency of heaven is what we need in these days. God, in his mercy, is showing us revelations that we had been, which have been reserved and preserved to this end time. And in particular, the revelation about the bride, about our end time identity. Because the bride has got to make herself 
ready. And uh, there will be many in the church, and I'm afraid, who will not be ready, will not have realized who they are, and will not have uh, taken, embraced uh, the, that truth. But these truths are not given, these revelations are not shared um, uh, with anybody. God shouts his truths but he whispers his secrets. God shouts his truths. The heavens declare the glory of God. It's shouting out the glory of God, shouting out his creativity, his artistry, his beauty, but he whispers his secrets. And that's an indication of the intimacy that he wants to bring us into. So, as, uh, as we draw to a close, and maybe sometime in the future, I will uh, have the opportunity just to share the full teaching on the church to Laodicea and how it is a, a prophetic word to the church today. But can I encourage you, can I encourage all of you to uh, begin to store up faith begin to store up. There is a currency and it needs to be invested. We need to invest in this time. And one of the things that concerns me so much is that we don't seem to know how, and I, I'm, I'm struggling and trying to learn this too, how to live by supernatural faith. There'll come a time when there is no buying or selling. As our eyes are open to the uh, Satan's agenda and we see the time and season that we're living in and the, the close proximity of the return of the Lord Jesus and all those things panning out in our day and age before our eyes. And we have to be able to store up. So in the day of famine, when there is no buying and selling, we have learned how to live by faith. Would you be able to put a a plate on the table like George Mueller did when he had the orphanages in Bristol and put the plate there uh, for all his children and get them to stand behind their seats at the breakfast table when there was no food at the orphanage and just these empty plates and to pray and to believe that God would send them food, multiply the food on the plate or, and in this case, a knock at the door and the baker had just uh, had a, a, a crazy time of, of cooking far too much bread and just didn't know what to do to, and needed to get rid of it. And please, Mr. Muller, would you take it off me? <laughs> the story of George Muller, who lived by faith and ran this orphanage by faith, is something that impacted my life so greatly in the early days of my teenagehood. Oh, that we can learn to live by faith. I'm not saying we shouldn't be aware of the need to preserve and maybe to store up certain things. It's called preps, isn't it? I'm not coming against that. But what I'm saying is I believe that God wants us to be a generation uh, of Josephs who invest in supernatural faith, faith that believes that God can multiply a piece of bread that can multiply and not let our shoe leather run out. When they were in the wilderness, they didn't ask for the baker when they wanted bread. They had manna. They didn't ask for the butcher when they wanted meat. They had quails. They didn't ask for a plumber when they wanted water, but were told to speak to the rock. Oh, my prayer is that for me and my wife and each one of you, that we learn now in this period of relative ease of living. It is getting difficult and the fuel prices are going up and so on and so on. But relatively, we're still very blessed that we learn in these days to live by faith. So we buy by faith those things from him that will he wants to give. 
we offer by faith and we say, Lord, thank you for your provision. So as I close, remember that uh, the Lord is pouring out upon us in these days such understanding of who we are and that we sometimes might need the salve to give us, to, to restore our sight and to get rid of the sores, as did the church at Laodicea, so that we can see clearly and properly where we are in God's timeline and where we are in the purposes and plans of God and where he wants us to invest our faith in him, that we may grow. We like the children of Israel in the wilderness, wandering through the desert. So don't compromise like the Laodiceans did. Don't compromise. Do be like a Daniel generation. And Lord, I pray that you will help us to be that in these days where compromise will be so, e so much a temptation, where giving in, where watering down, where being influenced by culture and, and, and uh, uh, the things that are around in the media. Lord, help us to see. Help us to see. Give us all we need, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.